Welcome to everyone here on this Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, many people are on the road, I'm sure, but uh, many will also be following us online. So welcome to our worship service as we begin a new year, the Advent season in preparation for Christmas and cr celebration of Christ's birth begins the four weeks before Christmas time. So we begin with our theme for the weeks ahead is good news of great joy. You'll hear more about that in the service. Uh, let us begin with our Advent gathering song. Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we have come into the presence of God. He has promised to be with us as we meet in his name, but we must confess that we are not worthy to stand in his presence. We have disobeyed him and broken his commandments. Therefore, let us confess our sins and plead for his mercy. And we pray, O holy and merciful Father, we confess that we have sinned. Too often we seek our own way. In our family life, we have neglected you. In our working life, we have forgotten you. In our personal lives, we have shut our hearts to you. Forgive us, restore us, and grant us newness of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God, our Heavenly Father, sent his Son, our Emmanuel, to be the atoning sacrifice for all our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. turn to the lighting of our Advent candle for our Advent wreath. Uh, the first light lit candle is the candle of prophecy. 
Just a word of explanation. The custom of lighting Advent candles in our worship is from Germany, as well as the Christmas tree. And the four candles of our Advent wreath on the outside represent the four Sundays of Advent. The middle white candle stands for the day of Jesus' birth and is lit on Christmas Day. So the message of each candle helps us prepare for Jesus' coming or Advent. The first Advent candle is called the candle of prophecy. It represents the first gospel light of the Savior for a world lost in the darkness of sin. From God's first promise of a Savior to Adam and Eve to the very end of the Old Testament, which we will hear tonight, all the prophets pointed to the coming of Jesus, the light of the world. In addition, the prophecies of the Bible also prepare us for Christ's second advent when he comes again in glory. Just as the Old Testament believers looked ahead to the first coming of Christ, so we look ahead to his future arrival. The blue color of the candle and all the altar cloths and the pyramids, my stole, points us to the color of heaven. It reminds us that Jesus came from heaven and because of him, we can trust that we are going to a heavenly home. So let us light the candle of prophecy, the first light of Jesus for all to see, and we'll sing the verse as the candle is lit. Let us join our hearts and voices together in the prayer of the day. We pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Protect us by your strength and save us from the threatening dangers of our sins. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We turn to the word of God for today. Our Old Testament lesson is actually the very last chapter of the entire Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, uh, verses 1 to 6. And as I mentioned earlier, all of the prophecies pointed to the coming Savior. Uh, there would be a, a bright light coming into the darkness. The sun of righteousness would soon be shining, but... It was going to take a while. People didn't realize, as they might have read Malachi about 430 B.C., that it would take another 400 plus years for the, the, this prophecy as well as all the others to find fulfillment. And so we prepare our hearts, too, for Jesus' second coming, which always seems to take a lot longer than we think. But this is what Malachi said. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble, and, that day will, is, and the day that is coming will set them on fire. That's reference to his second coming at the end of the world. Not a root or branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked, and they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my, of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, 
or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Here ends the entire Old Testament. Our hallelujah for the day. This lesson is taken from the first chapter of James, beginning at the second verse. So this is the beginning of his message after he introduces himself. James is the brother of Jesus. You could say that half-brother because uh, Mary and Joseph had children after Jesus was born, uh, whereas Jesus was only the child of Mary and the Son of God. And James has learned a lot in all of his early years. He uh, refused to believe in the Lord, and his brother, as the Savior. But that changed when Jesus died and rose again. And so James gives us some very good direction about believing in the Lord and not doubting. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. This is the word of the Lord. And let us confess our faith in our triune God with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please rise. We confess, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our sermon hymn. i 
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. The word of God is our gospel lesson for today, taken from Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 8. And let us rise to give honor to the very words and actions of our Lord. He's not born on this earth yet, but he sends an angel named Gabriel. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, don't, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will, will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, uh, which will come true at their appointed time. This is the word of the Lord. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, with all of the bad news you hear and see in the news, it's time to change the channel. And I think that's some very good advice as we come together in God's house. Instead of bad news, we have good news to share. And it's such a great news that it brings great joy to our hearts. And that's exactly what our theme is going to be as we prepare for Christmas time in the celebration of Christ's birth. Uh, the Lord has good news of great joy for us right now. Well, of course, you know where that phrase comes from, I think. It was when the angel came to the shepherds out in the fields of Bethlehem that they said, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. And why? 
For to you in the town of David, a Savior has been born, who is the Messiah, the Christ, the Lord. And so that's what it was all about. The greatest news of good joy comes from Jesus and his arrival. But all along as we prepare our hearts for this celebration once again, we see other announcements of good news, which brings great joy to all the people that hear it. And the very first one you heard in our reading, our lesson today, is to a man named Zechariah when Gabriel visits. And so we see the angel Gabriel finally coming to this elderly a man who is a priest in God's house. All of God's people had been waiting a long, long time. As I mentioned earlier, in uh, the very last book of the Old Testament, the last message that God brought to his people, it was another 400 years, four centuries, before all of this would finally find its fulfillment. And in the meantime, people were just falling away. Uh, the verse about Jesus in Malachi is this one. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And that's a reference to Jesus. The sun, S-O-N, is like the signing, shining sun, S-U-N, and he's bringing righteousness for all of the people. But it wasn't going to happen for a while. And people got sidetracked and... Uh, they started losing their true faith in the Lord. All of the people in God's temple, the priests and all the leaders and so forth, uh, they had kind of given up on anything ever changing or happening, and so they used their positions to exercise their power over others and go through all of the traditions and demanding that people follow their traditions and support them with their wealth. And there was really no sincerity of heart in them at all. And what about the common people? Well, they weren't being fed much of anything from God's word. They were not given any hope or peace or joy, just a bunch of mandates and rules. And so a lot of people kind of were falling away too. Uh, why was God waiting so long? He always has a purpose in everything he does. And we know from the rest of scripture that at just the right time, God had chosen Jesus to be born in this world. But before he would arrive, about a year before that happens, this is what we hear in our, our gospel lesson about a godly priest named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. Uh, both of them were righteous in the sight of God, it says, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. So in the midst of spiritual decay for all of Jerusalem, there was one priest at least and his wife who stayed faithful. They were righteous in the sight of God, which means they believed in the Lord and believed what he said and they they looked forward to the fulfillment of God's promises that a savior would come from all for all to pay for all of their sins, and they looked to the Lord for uh, their forgiveness and their strength and their encouragement. E everything looked so wonderful and fine for them, it might seem, but there was one big problem, which in that day and time was considered a curse, and that's the fact that they had no children, and Elizabeth was unable to conceive. You can imagine, and the angel referred to this about Zechariah's prayers being answered. They probably had been praying and praying and praying and praying through all the years. And then they uh, get turned 40 and then 50 and then 60. And soon Elizabeth is not, without a miracle, able to conceive anymore. And I suppose they were resigned to the fact that they weren't going to have any children. But God had something else in mind he uh, sent an angel to Zechariah. And Zechariah was serving as one of the priests in, uh, this is the best rendition I've been able to find of the holy place inside of the temple. 
and uh, behind that curtain there looks like a solid wall, but that's a curtain. That's the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant is and so forth, but the front part had the candelabra or menorahs and a table of showbread, and right there before the steps, the altar of incense. <clears throat> and Zechariah was blessed. He was chosen to give the sacrifice of incense on that particular day. You see, that was uh, something that not every priest had the opportunity to do. Uh, the way the priesthood was set up, all the priests would serve two weeks a year. The rest of the weeks, they usually were farmers and worked the land and produced their own food and crops. So they only served two weeks of a year and to come into the actual temple and give that, uh, the offering of incense, uh, that opportunity was chosen by lot among all the priests that were serving at the time. And so that's why there might be some priests who never in their lifetimes were able to do this, but Zechariah had been chosen, he had been blessed. And so he's the only one in the temple, and that kind of sets up the scene. Uh, he's the, uh, <clears throat> all the other people are outside worshiping and praying and singing and so forth, but only priests could go inside. And then as he begins to bring the off offering of incense, which, by the way, symbolizes our prayers going up to the Heavenly Father, God was hearing his prayers and sent an angel. Here's a little bit of rendition of Gabriel coming to Zechariah as he's doing the altar of incense. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. This is not something that ever happened before. And you notice what happens to Zechariah? He's scared out of his mind. He's afraid, startled with fear. I, I guess sometimes we have the idea that maybe angels of God are kind of like, uh, oh, like us. They show up as a human being on this earth and they're, they're kind of kind and gentle. And that might be in TV shows or movies and so forth, but that's not the reality. Angels are, first of all, warriors. When we call them the heavenly host, that means the heavenly armies. And they are there to do battle to the forces of evil. And they also are messengers. But I'm not sure exactly what Gabriel looked like, but he certainly would have been a formidable uh, being uh, that would scare the daylights out of just about anyone. I imagine this might be a little bit better rendition of his glory that he showed, and I would try to maybe put on a, a uniform of armor as well as one of the warriors for the Lord. But the angel had come to Zechariah with a message. He didn't want him to fear. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. We usually call him John the Baptist. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. So out of all of their many, many prayers that have been spoken over the years, and they probably had given up praying, uh, finally the angel says, God has been listening, he's been hearing, and you and your wife are going to have a child. He's going to be someone great in the eyes of the Lord. What else? He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Some of that should sound familiar if you paid attention to the very last chapter of the Old Testament. The Gabriel is quoting Malachi. And he's saying, this son of yours, that's the fulfillment of the prophecy that Malachi gave so long, long ago. He's going to be like the Elijah to promise. He's coming in the spirit and power of Elijah, and he's going to be turning the hearts of the people back to the Lord. And families, parents, children, everyone will seek the Lord once again. 
And so this was going to be a very special child. God was going to be, was keeping his promises. And wonder of wonders, these two elder, elderly uh, people would become parents. And that was just a little bit hard for Zechariah to take. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. On the outside, that looks like an innocent question, doesn't it? Uh, how can I be sure of this? How, how, how in the world is this going to happen? But we know from Gabriel's reply that this was more than just a simple question. Zechariah in his heart didn't believe it. Uh, he said, this is impossible. It's not going to happen at all. My wife is beyond having children. We are all too old. This, this is not something that's going to happen. And he was contradicting the angel in his heart. But Gabriel would have none of it. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. What's the matter, Zechariah? You fell down before me. I am in this powerful angel, and you're not going to believe me? I, sent, I received a message from God to share to you. It's the greatest good news that you've ever received in your life. And you're not going to believe me? And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. Because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. And sometimes we might think to ourselves, well, Zechariah, how could you doubt? Here's that powerful angel and right in front of you. He's got some really good news for you and, and you don't believe him? You doubt that any of this could possibly happen? What's wrong with you, Zechariah? And my next question is, what's wrong with us? Because we have the same problem, don't we? Oh, I'll have to confess that I've never seen a powerful, mighty angel appear to me in person. Uh, that doesn't happen too often. It uh, happened for Zechariah. But what did Gabriel bring to Zechariah? He brought a message from God. The word angel means messenger. And so he was bringing this message. It was God's very own word. And Zechariah just couldn't believe it. Has that ever happened to you or to me? We have God's direct message. We have all of his words in the Bible, and yet there's so many times that we just have a hard time believing it. Some things just don't work out the way we figured in life, and it seems that maybe God isn't answering our prayers like he didn't answer Zechariah's and Elizabeth's. And even though we might certainly trust the fact that Christmas is real, Jesus was born, the Son of God come from heaven, becoming a human being, and that Jesus came to be our Savior, as the angel announced to the shepherds. And he, to do that, he was going to give his life on the cross, rise again from the dead. And I pray that all of you listening, and those of you here, don't really ever doubt that. But when things don't go right, we have our doubts, don't we? God has given us some wonderful promises and it's just so difficult to hang on to some of them. For example, God says, fear not. I have redeemed you. That takes us to Jesus. I have called you by name. You are mine. That takes us to our baptisms and the power of the Holy Spirit. So don't be afraid. I've given you all those things. So when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. The, the idea is like crossing over a river and the rushing waters might just sweep you down, downstream and you're facing a potential drowning. And God says, that won't happen. When you're going through the trials of life that seems like they're going to tug you under and pull you under for good, I'll be with you. You will pass through those waters. You will make it through. 
And when we're in the midst of the river and the stream is really tugging, uh, uh, tugging to drag us down, it just seems so hard to believe that sometimes. God says, Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, uh, and my co nor will my covenant or peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Everything in the whole world can be falling apart. The mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet nothing can shake the love of God for us. That's his grace. Even though we deserve to be swept away and the mountains to fall on us, yet he says, because of my unfailing love and my compassion for you, my covenant, my forgiveness in Christ, and the peace that you have through me will never be removed. Those are the things we need to cling to when we don't understand. You see, one of the favorite promises that, uh, of God that I like to quote to people is this one, that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him. So in all the things that are happening right now, and you just can't seem to figure it out, we know that God will work that all together for our good, for the ones who love him and are called according to his purpose, the passage says. And so we can depend on that promise, can't we? Even though you don't know the answer, God has promised to work it out for our good. That's important when you're going through some of the incidents of life, isn't it? Uh, let's say someone is looking for a companion and they've been searching for years and years and can't find that right person to be a spouse, and then suddenly God makes it happen. Or maybe someone is trained for a job and really excited about a career. They've been applying all over the place and sending the resumes out everywhere. And it just doesn't seem to be happening. They've been waiting for years and years. And then suddenly God makes it happen. Or maybe someone's been dealing with health issues that just drag on forever and ever. And it doesn't seem like there's any solution. And uh, the doctors say it's impossible. There is no hope. And then God makes it happen. Yes, I have seen that happen. Many times God might re answer the prayer by taking us home to heaven, but so very often he has turned things around, especially in incidents of cancer that I can think of. And we know that God will make it all work together for good. It is just so hard for us to accept that sometimes. You see, once in a while we treat God's messages like an email. Uh, you read it and forget about it. I have to confess, sometimes that happens to me. I, I read an email from one of you. There's something that I should answer or to do or let you know. And maybe I was kind of busy when I read it. And I forget all about it. And it just kind of out blanks uh, my memory cells until you remind me. Hey, what about that, Pastor? And so very often... That can happen to God's messages, too. Uh, we read them, we believe them for a time, but then we get all so busy and consumed with life and everything that has to be done that we kind of set all of the things he wants us to dwell on and ponder off to the side because we got so many things to do. And it's Christmas time. My, uh, the, all the things that I need to get accomplished have just doubled between Thanksgiving and Christmas Day. And how in the world can I get through all of that and the hecticness and the journey of trying to get everything just right? And we need to stop for a moment and remember that in the midst of all of that, there is still good news of great joy. God has kept his promises he sent Jesus into this world, and because Jesus is that promised Savior, God is planning and will keep all of his promises. And that's why the greatest and most important preparations you can do for, the, for Christmas at this time of year has nothing to do with presents or food 
or gathering together the family or workers for a party or something like that. The most important thing that can bring us true peace and hope and joy is concentrating on the promises of God. We know that God will answer our prayers just like he did with Zechariah and Elizabeth. James talked about that a little bit in our epistle lesson. Uh, Many times people pray and pray for various things that they need in an earthly way, and that's not a wrong thing to pray for, but what does James point us to and says we should never doubt Uh, We pray for this. God is always going to give it, believe it. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. And he will give it generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. If you doubt it, like Zechariah was doubting God's great wisdom, uh, then it's like you're a wave wave in the sea. being blown and tossed by the wind. It's totally unstable and everything else. But don't ever doubt your prayers. God hears them and he grants those that we know are his will. Again, what was James praying for? A health, a long life, a lot of money? No. Wisdom. And where does the great wisdom of God for us come? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. And we receive all of that wisdom through the word that God has given and made all of his promises. So just as we don't doubt that Jesus is our Savior, we don't ever want to doubt that God will answer our prayers because we are children of our Heavenly Father through Christ. He's made us that. We're part of the family. And what father who is all wise and all compassionate, is going to deny his children. He's not going to unless there's a good reason. And he knows better, doesn't he? Jesus said it this way, and whatever you, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask for anything in my name and I will do it. Sometimes people uh, change that into uh, like rubbing the, the, uh, the bottle for the genie to pop out and, ask, and give you anything you want for three wishes. That's not what Jesus is saying. Whatever you ask in my name, by faith in the Lord, by trusting that he knows what's best and that his will is going to be the best answer of all, when you pray in my name, God will answer. He will give whatever you need. And so we want and need the most important thing is our faith that relieves those doubts. And the true wisdom of God as we cling to God's promises because the Lord knows that in the world of our times uh, we certainly need it. There's a whole world of darkness around us, isn't there? And as the Daylight gets a little bit dimmer each day and we get closer to the end of the year. Uh, There's a light shining in the darkness. A light that you can share with others to help them through their times of difficulty and despair. God will keep his promises. It may not be exactly when we want it to happen, but he will keep his promises. Just like the angel said, I want to concentrate on the very last thing Gabriel said to Zechariah. Um, All these things that I said will come true at their appointed time. Whether you believe it or not, Zechariah, it's going to happen. You're going to have a son. And all these things will happen at their appointed time. That means at their proper time, at their right time, we can trust God to guide our lives just as Jesus came into the world at the appointed time and his forerunner named John helped prepare the way in the hearts of the people so we can depend that at just the right time, God will guide our way. That's good news of great joy to prepare our hearts 
for celebrating the greatest news of Jesus' birth. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And let us rise and sing about our good news, the heart, the glad sound. Let us rise and sing. turn to the Lord in prayer, and I'm happy to say that our prayers are being answered. Um, Kimberly Mangione is with us tonight in worship. We had been praying for her stay at the hospital just a week ago, and God still needs to answer some more prayers for her health, but she's able to be here tonight, and that's a wonderful blessing. I'd also like to pray for the family of Marjorie Prasad. Marjorie is one of our members, too, that was just called home this month. And we'll keep all others in prayer in a general way. As we bring our prayers to the Lord, perhaps there's someone on your heart that you'd like to keep in mind. Let us pray. <clears throat> o come, O come, Emmanuel. Dear Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, we long for your appearing. Come to cheer us with your promises as you once cheered your ancient people through their long night of waiting and watching. Come to restore our hope. Rouse us from the slumber of despair. Lift our hearts from petty earthbound goals and direct our eyes above from where you will soon come to make all things right again. Come and work in us a godly grief and a genuine sorrow over sin. Forgive us uh, through your holy supper that we receive tonight. Forgive us through the blessing of your word. Come also to rekindle our joy as we prepare to celebrate your first coming. Do not permit a frenzied busyness to rob us of your peace or to deprive us of times to ponder and to wonder at your word. Fill us with the quiet delight of finding you in the manger once again and keep hearts and minds undisturbed by the great throng that streams by, uncaring. So, Lord, for those enduring great sorrow, for those undergoing spiritual trial, and for those whose restless hearts have no knowledge of your coming, O oh Lord, we pray, uh, work by your word in their hearts, comfort and strengthen and illumine them with the sweet peace that was brought by your love. For those who are going through physical and medical difficulties, O oh Lord, we pray, continue to put your hand of help and healing upon them. We give you thanks that Kimberly could be with us today in our service and ask that you would continue to guide her help and her healing uh, so that all things might go well. Continue to be Betty's, uh, with Betty Kennedy's mom, Louise, who is going through many sorrows and difficulties uh, physically as she gets older. Also, Sarah Heffler's brother, Charles Surink, who we have not prayed for before. Uh, he had a cardiac arrest last week. Put your hand of help and healing upon him. Continue to be with all the families who've lost loved ones, especially uh, uh, the family of Marjorie Prasad and Donna Bethel. Uh, continue to guide all of them to see that heaven is our home and that we are just strangers here on this earth till God takes each of us to himself. Continue to bless us, O Lord, and be with us as we also join in the prayer that you taught us. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Then receive the blessing of God's name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Please be seated for our closing hymn. Some of you were able to make it over this Thanksgiving weekend. I just want to clue you in on next week's good news of great joy. And that's when the same angel, Gabriel, comes to visit Mary. And that will be our subject from Luke chapter 1. And then of the other things coming up, the one thing I'd like you to think about signing up right now for is our Advent Family Day. You've noticed a lot of the banners and Advent uh, colors are out. Uh, we'll be setting up our tree and some other of the Christmas decorations on that day. Uh, and also, uh, everything has been prepared for a special, uh, kind of like a Christmas party for our teens on that time, and some other special things for everyone in the family. So all are encouraged to, to come for that time. And then, uh, for our Wednesdays at Advent, there's a special video I'd like you to see. So the King Shall Come will be our theme for the Wednesdays in Advent. Uh, the first two, this coming Wednesday and the next one, will be online. Uh, in Advent, uh, basically a Bible study, you might include a song or two. And that will be on Facebook Live, and then you can always see that later. And then the third one 
will be our special Advent by candlelight service that will be right here on Wednesday, December 13th. And uh, the, if you would like more information about hosting a table for that night and inviting others, uh, we've got more information on doing that. I'll, and there's another sign-up sheet, not only for if you'd like to be a host, but if you just plan and would like to come for that service so we can plan the tables properly, we'd like people to sign up for that. So there's actually three sign-up sheets there. Uh, the family day on that Saturday, the 9th, and then two of them for either attending or hosting on the 13th. So we'll have the prelude during our Wednesday night online and culminate in a wonderful service together. So those are the things coming up for Advent. And may the Lord continue to prepare our hearts. Thank you.